This podcast is brought to you from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 48 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and this is Mindy Corney. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Um, kind of excited about this episode. You are? Yeah, why oh, not? Oh, good. Oh, I mean, no, I mean, yeah, you of course. Surprised, of course, but yeah. I think we have a lot of great stuff to share. Yeah. And um, last week when I was getting ready for this episode and doing some prep and things like that, I put yeah. a tweet out just saying, hey, we're doing screencasting on I the next that. episode. Yeah. What's your uh, tips or ideas or tools? Mm-hmm. And we got some good uh, feedback on yeah. that from people. So this is kind of like crowdsourced... Uh, episode in some ways it's kind of fun this episode is brought to you by, by twitter twitter <laughs> by you maybe by you. If you yeah right depending right? on who you are yeah right so yeah feel free to keep a lookout for those tweets and uh we'll yeah bring people in as much as we can for Absolutely. that kind of stuff we have tons of news and follow-up today you know last episode we did did we do all nuggets last episode yeah, it was I, nuggety. Yep. I feel like we could do all news and follow-up this yes, episode I know. if we really I wanted know. to yeah it's a big one yeah should we start with Google Classroom again? We should, <laughs> yeah. because last week when we talked about Google Classroom, there was two things that we said, oh, it would be great if they just fixed this, or people are still complaining about that, right. and they fixed it. They did, yeah. So I guess they listened to our podcast. Well, thank you, Google. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so teachers can now add materials to Google Classroom in lieu of that About page right. that we talked about that right. was... Missing. So mm-hmm. you've tried that, haven't you? Yeah. So I went in and created, I was trying to play with it and think about like, is there a way to organize materials or, and there were, there was. Yeah. So um, if I had like a unit or something like that and I needed all my learning materials together, it's nice that you can put it like under a heading or whatever. And then you can pin that topic to the top. Yes. So uh, you, so you can, can move topics current, up and down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's handy. Um, Hopefully that will help those people who were missing the about page where they put their syllabus and other materials and stuff like that. Yeah, right. That's good. Yeah. Um, And because it's not like an assignment, you know, they won't have like due dates or reminders and stuff for kids. It's just it's a separate thing there. Yeah. Um, Another thing they added was uh, we talked about how certain features were only available when you started a new class. Right. So the classwork tab from the new classes is available on your old classes if you want Mm -hmm. Um, you go into your old class you click on the question mark in the bottom left hand corner and there is an option that says add classwork page right so make sure you like it though because i don't think you get to go back yeah right so like once that classwork page is created okay so i was talking to a couple teachers this last week and i'm like I know you can convert it to the new, but I'm not sure that you can go back. So make sure, because they were just recycling old classes and taking stuff out. And I don't know what they were, they were keeping the same class anyway. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you can do this, but I don't feel like you can go back. Okay. Often there is a way, like, you know, try the new Google forums yeah, right. and then switch back to classic. But yeah. maybe it will be available for a while, but then yeah, after right. a certain date, they'll just mm-hmm. chop it. Yeah. And it goes right. away. All right. So more Google News. Uh, the YouTube editor is back. I know. I heard that you or saw that you said something about that. What kind, do you think of it? Or kind what was, of back. Yeah. yeah. It's coming um, back for sure then, right? It's on I its mean, way it's just, back. Yeah. Yes. So you kind of have to dive into the Creator Studio beta mm-hmm. inside of YouTube. So I have to flip a switch and turn on to the beta. Right. And, and then, then you can go back in. You can flip back and forth between classic and... That you can flip back yeah, and forth. Uh-huh. Right now you can anyway. Yeah, One right. day that will be <laughs> gone out of beta too. and yeah. that will be gone. So they're bringing about the YouTube editor. It's very kind of stripped down right now because mm-hmm. all you can really do is you can trim the beginning and the end. You can uh, make cuts in the middle. You can add uh, a kind of video template thing on the end. Mm-hmm. But um, there's other things that are missing, like you don't have transitions, you don't have the music, you don't Mm -hmm. have, you know, those Creative Commons videos or or anything else like that. So interesting. I mean, they put this splash screen up when you go there for the first time and saying, hey, new stuff will be appearing regularly. Check back soon. Because that was missed. 
Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. If you're like, uh, you know, Chromebooks go, and you're mm-hmm. looking for an online video editor, and you don't want to pay for Wii Video, then uh, YouTube Editor covered a lot of bases there. Yeah. Thank you once again, Google. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are you sad because I heard that Google is discontinuing Inbox? How do you feel about this? Uh, and when is it? You have it written down. Oh, March 2019. So you've got a little time. You can say goodbye. I was sad. I was sat yeah. down with um, one of our regional administrators, yeah, Shane, Shane right? and yeah. he came over and we sat down and we commiserated each other oh, for a few yeah. minutes he, just because... He brought up like 15 times the other day. He was, was like, all in on Invox <laughs> as well. And we sat down and we're like, oh, can you believe it's going away? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's going away. So I, I just made the hard cut back to Gmail yeah. and I'm just going to try and forget it ever existed yeah, and, right. and move on. So I think the... And I, like, hadn't used Inbox all year. Like, I didn't even realize it until you sent that email. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I haven't used Inbox all year. i just been using the updated Inbox, obviously, Gmail. You, you know mean, what I mean? Do you mean, like, like since the school year mail. started again? Yes, yeah, right, after school year. Summer. Yes. That's how I my brain works is in school years, not yeah. in, like, calendar years. Um, so I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't – I guess so I guess I didn't miss it. I hadn't even thought about it. And, you I, know – So I think – the one thing that I wish mail was going to have was that more streamlined, pretty look that Inbox has. Yes. It doesn't gonna, really. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, I started the year the same way as you because inside of Inbox, there used to be this setting that said, every time I click mail or something, take me to Inbox yeah. instead of Gmail. And I started clicking mail at the start of the year from the, the Google homepage. And mm-hmm. then it took me to Gmail and I'm like, what's going on here? So then I just had to get it from the, the drop down, the, yeah. the little app launcher. Yeah. And then I see this, and I thought, okay, well, that starts to make sense. Then, so, you look so sad. I, I, I kind of am sad, <laughs> but I'll put up with it. Another one for the graveyard, tech graveyard. Yeah, uh, inbox. New Google Sites updates. Um, new section layouts, mm-hmm. which is kind of like uh, we, we use Weebly at, at Grantwood yep. for our team site, and that has a lot of those kind of section layouts where you can have like two column layouts or pictures, mm-hmm. and gallery type things. Which is nice, and they also have buttons, which is, I would say, also Weebly-esque, where you can drag a button over, and you can make that button go to a specific hyperlink Uh and put a label on the button. So those are coming, and that's nice little updates for Google Sites. I never am in Google Sites. I should really go. I don't have a purpose for it right now. Yeah. You just go in and play with it. I know. It is so much better than it used to be, and they keep adding new things, so... I like it, but I'd like them to see. I'm just going to say this because yeah, then maybe they'll, maybe they'll, Google will listen. They'll just do it. I'd like to see a blogging component. Yeah. For students or teachers that wanted yeah. to blog from Google right. Sites, there's yeah. not really a good way to do that right now. Yeah. So give us a blog, Google, yeah. and then Google Come Sites on. will be complete. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think that's because I think there are teachers that have asked us too about blogging on Google Sites, and like I said, I haven't been in there a ton, but I know that people say it's just not conducive to that. So. Yeah. Be nice, a feature to add. Um. Oh yeah. So I have something new with Flipgrid. Since we talked about Flipgrid last time, I came across this this last week that now you can sign into Flipgrid with a QR code. Okay. Um. So you still go in. Um. And you get that email too from Frank. Hi, Frank. Frank emailed me and was like, I can't find that grid password anywhere. I had to go and find it for him. So truly, if you need to find that password, let me know. Yes. <laughs> Send us an email. <laughs> I have a little screencast I made for Frank. Anyway, so you still go in and create a new grid. Um, and then you have to have a student ID list um, where you add the names of students and each student then has to have a unique ID of some sort. And then you download those individual ID QR codes. So mm-hmm. um, each student has their own QR code. Sounds like CISA. And um, so then they don't have to log in and know those passwords every time, which I think is kind of nice because that password thing is kind of a pain. Yeah. Students can just log into Flipgrid now with their QR code. So I, I almost said sounds like CISA <laughs> because it's like CISA when you send home that the letters to, yeah. you know, to each parents parent and then yep. each kid has their own QR code. Yep. You scan the QR code yep. to sign in and right. stuff. But Yeah. Yeah, so when students go to log in, where it says, like, student ID, right, is where that little, there's a little, like, red icon, or so it's like a little camera icon or something like that. So you have to click on the camera, and then it'll open up that camera to scan the QR code. So, I don't know. 
I like it. I mean, I yeah. think Flipgrid is going to come out with a lot of updates yeah. um, right now. I think they're mm-hmm. they're in a, a position where they're just on a roll yeah. right now. Yeah. So yeah. doing good and stuff. And they were anyway. So like this new. Yeah. Yes. This new acquisition will be yeah. good for them too. Acquisition, my. Uh-huh. Oh, I've been saving that word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. So moving along. All right. Well, <laughs> I saw something that was kind of interesting because I know on our team we've been talking about the Q robot and maybe getting yeah. one of those Q robots, yep. which is it's like a Dash robot, but has a few more bells and whistles, uh-huh. I guess. Yep. And so I think I got this in an email from Wonder Workshop as well. They have a curriculum for the Q robot, which is for grades six through eight. Okay. And... Um, it goes through a lot of interesting things like the design thinking process and block-based programming, even JavaScript programming, because that's something you can do with the new Q robot now. Okay. Uh, functions and loops and variables yeah. and, and all that computer science type stuff, because yeah. sometimes uh, I think we struggle to think about how we could use these robots effectively and yeah. how we can make the most of all the features they have. So. Mm-hmm. Also, being middle school as well, I think sometimes these robots get pitched more elementary. And, uh, yeah, sure. So using those with kids in 6th through 8th grade, um, it's good to have those curricular supports. So I'll put a link to those in the show notes and you can take a look at those. Mm-hmm. So um, I can't pull it up because my Wi-Fi is spinning. But also there's a new Sphero. There is also a new yeah. Sphero called the Sphero Bolt. Bolt. Right? Bolt. Yeah. Yes. I think, is this the one that Amber saw at ISTE? Yes. So they can talk to each other. Is this right? Yes. So if you have more than one bolt, they can, like, work with one another. They can and, communicate yeah, with each other. Right. And this one looks a bit different from a normal sphere. I mean, it is the, the same shape and everything. Is it still a sphere? Oh. It's still a sphere, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Yeah. But it has this um, LED um, array on the top. Nice. Um, which you can program and and make it do different things. So it has it says here it has advanced sensors to keep tabs on bolt speed and direction, and it's got this LED matrix, mm-hmm. an eight by eight matrix on top that animates and displays real time data, and infrared communication, bolt to bolt communication yeah. enables new games and advanced coding tactics. Interesting. Which I think would be similar to like, you know, dash and dot, like when dash yeah. sees dot, yeah. do this and that kind of thing. So they could mm-hmm. you could do those kinds of conditional programmings. Yeah. But isn't this the one Amber so at ISTE and, you know, they, they took her into a room and yeah, she had to sign, sign this yes, NDA yes. And, and all this kind of good stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, she had a sneak peek in, in the summer. Yeah, and then she wouldn't really tell us about it. No, I She know. really took that seriously. She did, yeah. yeah. Sign her name in blood. <laughs> so the Sphero Boat is uh, retailing for $150. Yeah. Maybe that will come down in, in a few months or whatever, but uh, yeah. it's certainly more expensive than recent Spheros. Yeah, for sure. I think so. So, um, I heard you say the other day that you have the new iOS. Did you add that? iOS 12? Yes. yes. I, well, I've been using the oh, iOS public course. beta of this course. summer. Of course you have. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, what would you think of it? What's going on with it? What's new or what? Well, as we record, Mindy, it is out today, oh. September 17th. Yeah. I was going to say, I haven't seen it drop yet, but I guess I didn't know what the date was either. <laughs> Probably sometime around noon today. Okay. It's oh, gonna my. Drop. Okay. All right. Well, they're pretty methodical and mm-hmm. clockwork with things yeah. like this. But, yeah. Um, so, it works on devices up to five years old, which I think is kind of interesting. It is interesting. You could have like an iPhone 5S, I think. Uh-huh. Or back to iPad errors, maybe, yeah. and uh, still put iOS 12 on it. And it's not one of these like landmark, huge, big updates. Yeah. But it's one of these ones where they're concentrating on, you know, how sometimes you update your device and then suddenly it doesn't work as well and yeah. it runs a bit slower and people yeah. get paranoid and yeah, say right. Apple's doing this on purpose yeah, and right. buying your device. But right. Actually, it makes older devices run faster. Really? Yes. Um, there's all kinds of like new notes. That's because of the bad press, I guarantee it. It could be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, they they had them, this yeah. uh, event recently, or you probably heard about, but um, one of the things they said, had this woman come up on talking about environmental issues and mm-hmm. how Apple 
actually want your products to last a long time because it's less of an impact on the environment when they have to like throw that stuff away. Oh, and really? So, wow. You sound skeptical. Uh, yeah, sure. I don't yeah? know. That's not a, yeah, okay. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Apple. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just got an email the other day, did you, about the new iPhone coming out? Um, have you looked at that at all? Or no? I need a new phone. Oh, I, are you going to the big dog? Are you going brand spanking new? Like I don't iPhone know. 10, I XR, have, ST, I, PLL? <laughs> I mean, uh, like, I don't know. Soup. Yeah, right? <laughs> I have an iPhone 6S right now. Yeah. And it only has 16 gigabytes. Yeah. So I am limping along a little bit. Yeah. I need to make a decision oh. soon. Oh, boy. So we'll see. Okay. Keep us updated. Um, One more. One more, because we've been talking now for like Forever. 20 minutes. Jeez, already. Great longest news and follow-up. So, Padlet, mm-hmm. new to you. I think. Okay. Back channel chats? Back, back channel, channel templates. templates for Padlet boards. Hmm. I feel like they were always there, but I didn't know they were always yeah, there. right, right. And, you know, you can set up um, different forms for your Padlets. Um I don't know if these are new or not, but yeah. um, back channel templates. Templates. We yeah, talked about things like today's that. meat going away, yeah. so oh, you could so uh, yeah. you could do that inside yeah. Padlet now right. if you wanted. Okay. And the other new thing I saw was they have this option called Screen okay. for Padlet, where you can record your screen with Padlet. What? Yes. I didn't know that. They built a screencasting tool. Oh, into Padlet. Padlet. You can record your screen and post directly to your Padlets. We love you and we hate you. I know. I put that on ah. the notes. I said, it's the tool we hate to love. <laughs> <laughs> so they keep adding new stuff. Shoot. And that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, what's even more cool is like if you use Firefox, Mindy. And I don't oh. know if you know anyone that uses Firefox. <laughs> just you. It just works straight <laughs> out of the box. You don't need to do anything. You just really? record. If you're on Chrome, you did a Chrome extension on Safari. Oh, you have okay. to install install the mac os app okay and and windows edge it's got an extension for that okay. there's one for chromebooks there's one for an ios you just use the native screencasting thing but it puts it straight into your padlet nice. so if you wanted to put a little introduction for students on how yeah. something works you could just open padlet start screen recording and it drops it straight in that padlet that you're about to share with students oh padlet oh padlet oh padlet but I think it leads us nicely on to the next part of our I show. I think so, too. So, serve to you piping hot today. Our main course is screencasting for the win. Screencasting for the win. You came up with that by yourself, didn't you? I did. <laughs> That's a gamer thing. Oh, I FTW. like it. FTW. Yeah. Okay. So, screencasting, I feel like we, I get asked a lot about screencasting. Do you? Or I feel like I'm getting asked more about screencasting than I ever have in the past. I think so, too. And I think part of it is we're seeing a lot of schools experiment with blended learning. Yeah. And when you're doing those little breakout groups of kids where you can leave an instructional video for them to mm-hmm. watch while you're working one-on-one with other students... It gives you the ability to be in like two places at one time. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, people who maybe hadn't previously considered screencasting because they were doing right. whole group teaching and things yep. like that are now thinking, hey, there's some advantages to this. Mm-hmm. So I thought it'd be a fun thing to talk about yeah. and uh, see where we can give people some hints and ideas. Yep, I agree. Uh, and I thought we could break it down into like four different parts here. Okay. Things to do before you start your screencasting. Mm, mm-hmm. Things to remember while you are screencasting. Some things you could do optionally after you finish your screencast. Yep. And the important thing that probably everybody asks about is what tools, tools could I use yeah. to actually do the screencast? And right. we talked about one already, which yep. was Padlet, but uh, yep. we've got some other good ones too. Yeah. So when, and I kind of remember the first. I remember the moment that I was like, all of a sudden in my head was like, well, why don't I just record myself giving the directions for this station that the kids are... I remember like, and then I just made videos like crazy. Yeah. They were like, and then I tied QR codes to them to share, which we'll get to that, I suppose, later. But um, I would say the most important thing is that you need a quiet place and you also need a sign for your door. So if you are Mm. recording in your classroom at the end of the day, the custodian will come in because they don't know that you're 
and they might even still come in with a sign on the door, you know, because they're just doing their job. And yep. But make a sign for your door that says, recording, please come back later or something like that. Which is not too dissimilar to podcasting because yes, right. we had to find a quiet room for this. And yeah. we, well, I don't think we don't do it anymore. We don't but, put the sign up anymore. But we used to have a sign that said, podcasting, please do not right. disturb or something yes, like that on right, there. Right, right. And then um, I, and we do this for the podcast too, I guess, is, well, we always make me take my jewelry off. Yes, so we do. Because uh-huh. <laughs> I'm noisy otherwise. Mr. But T over there. <laughs> yes, same thing for, you know, if you're recording at your desktop and stuff like that, you just want to make sure that, you know, you've got kind of a quiet space around you so you're not thunking around mm-hmm. um, and turning off your notifications on your devices. So you're not – that's one thing I think with screencasting that I don't necessarily do that I, you know, so like I'll have a email notification pop up and off of my screen. Not that it's that big of a deal, but – should turn off those notifications and i don't yeah yes. absolutely because i mean yeah. they can if nothing else they can just throw you off your right your role a little bit and yeah. think oh what was that and then yeah. you pause and you're like wait now i pause and now i do what no what now what do i say yeah, and, right right yeah um i like to also it, it depends on what i'm screencasting but um sometimes it's fun just to take a look at your desktop and what's actually on there because <laughs> if i look at mine right now it's covered in all kinds of files and yeah. screenshots and in fact, yeah. well, probably all screenshots. Yeah. Um, and that you just grab all that stuff and throw it in a folder yeah. and then just put stuff on yes, it. Right. So that if you actually have to show your desktop that there's not a whole bunch of distracting things on there right. or people people like me probably thinking, wait, your desktop looks like that. Yeah, that is right. horrible. That's <laughs> that terrible. would kill me. Yes, yes, right. And judge you and stuff like that. But <laughs> I would never do that. But, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, some people might. So clean up your des- your desktop. Um, I don't know. Move your windows around. Just make thing- Make sure things aren't in the way that don't need to be there, I guess. Right. right. Have all your tabs open that you're going to need, too. So if you're flipping back and forth, you don't necessarily mm. want to show people that you're typing in the address as you go. Because yeah. that's just wasting their precious time and yours as well. So Absolutely. Up and ready to go. I put on here, um, close other tabs and apps and windows and things that you don't need. Right. And part of that is notifications. Yeah. Part of that is uh, if you have a computer like mine, mm-hmm. which you may actually hear in the background. No kidding. That thing sounds like it's going to take off. The fans are kicking in because um, there's lots of things going on at one time. Right. And all I really have here running is an audio recorder and a browser, but... Um, uh, Apparently, for my computer, that's quite the workout right now. <laughs> tired. So if you don't want your computer slowing down or giving you different problems when you're mm-hmm. screencasting, close down some other apps. Mm-hmm. Just save a bit of RAM and stuff like that. Right. And I think it's important, too, to have kind of a plan before you get started, right? So you don't want to um, ramble and ramble and ramble because your video should be short mm-hmm. as well. So make sure that you kind of plan ahead or even have a practice run to kind of make sure, like, okay, I want this to be three minutes or less. You know, so I was going to ask you what oh. you did for that. How do you how do you plan ahead for a screencast? Um, these days I don't plan ahead at all. I just right. hammer it out. But a lot of the screencasts I send are just like for one person that is just yes. asking for something, and it's easier for me just to create a quick screencast of you know what they need to do or where they can find that button or something like that. Like for Frank. Like for Frank, right? Yeah. So, and I even was like, oh nope, not there, Frank. Uh, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> But I think as a teacher, one of the things that I did was I would kind of run through and practice it first. Um, Because a lot of the time it was like practicing like a math strategy or something like that. So I would practice it and then I'd record it and most often would record probably twice because the first time I did it was like, nope, not quite right. So I'll do it again. Um, but yeah, I never like wrote anything down or anything like that, but I definitely had a plan of what I was going to do and stuff like that. So Yeah, and I feel that's pretty typical for someone like you who's an experienced screencaster, oh, sure. you know. I mean, yeah, right. I think when people first start off, some people yeah, like it's kind the, of intimidating too. Some people like the security of having like a script where they just yeah, read sure. Yeah. And they write down everything they want to say. Yeah. And I've I've definitely seen that before. Yeah. And you know, so you could do a word for word script. Absolutely. Um sometimes if it's something I'm not familiar with or I forget things in, I'll mm-hmm. do like bullet points yeah, sure. in an order so that I just remember to hit do certain this, things say this, and yeah. say this and say that. So um but yeah, some kind of plan mm-hmm. to go ahead and even if it's maybe just a quick practice run through, like yeah. you said, I think that's a good way to start. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So after that 
moving to while well, you're actually recording your screencast. Yes. I think um, an external microphone yeah. is a good way to go if you can get your hands on one of those. Yeah, right. And if you're listening in a Grant Wood school and you want to try out mm -hmm. what an external microphone sounds like, we can help you out with that. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to see a music teacher later uh -huh. today oh, who nice. wants to record some music ensembles. And she's like, we've been doing it with the built-in microphone on the Mac, but the quality is not yeah, great. Uh, right. So we want to see what else we can do. I think a microphone makes a big difference. What kind of microphone are you taking up there? I'm going to take some different ones up yeah. there. I'm going to try the Yeti. I'm going to try the Snowball. I'm going yeah. to try one of these with an iMic Pre that can plug into the yeah. headphone jack. Yeah. Would we'll you try some different things and experiment? And yeah. I don't know what the best yeah, solution is going to be yet, mm -hmm. so I'll just take a bunch. Yeah, see. for sure. So I think that's important because you do want your um, audio sound to be high quality. Um, and I did hear once that... People are more willing to watch bad video with good audio oh. than good video with bad audio. Oh. Think about that for a second. I can kind of, I, 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 could, I could see that. Because I, I do that a lot anyway. I listen more than I watch because I'll just, I'll keep working and yeah. like have something going so that I can kind The of, video could be yeah. really good, but if you can't yeah. really hear what they're saying yeah, or it's like echoey or there's dogs yeah. barking in the background or right. anything else, that's really Computer awkward, taking off. Computer taking off, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is interesting that you put this on here. Don't stop even if you make mistakes. Oh, that was like the biggest thing I, I learned for screencasting. Really? We had these guys come in from um, a production company to uh -huh. do um, to talk about TechSmith Camtasia yeah. and uh, give us some training on this. And this was maybe three or four years ago. Okay. And that was the biggest thing I learned that was just keep going because mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the po potential of using the video editor later. Yeah. And the uh, number of times I started a screencast, messed up somewhere, yeah. stopped, yeah, started right, again, right. messed up somewhere towards yeah. the end, started, yeah. stopped, start again. And if you just keep going, make a mistake. Yeah. I mean, we do this on the podcast. Yeah. Spoiler right. alert. Yeah. Right. We make mistakes and I'll yeah. go back later and I'll cut them out. Um, then, yeah, you, your, your flow will just keep going. Yep. You just stop for a second, compose yourself, say it again and keep mm -hmm. going. Yeah. Um, and I would also suggest maybe like leaving a little space before you start again, right? To make mm. your editing a little bit easier. So yeah. instead of having to cut off like in the middle of a sentence or something, leave yourself a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a cushion around those mistakes so they're easy to just go in and snip out. Yeah, the guys that were working with us, he, he always had this routine where he clapped really yeah, right. hard on the microphone yeah. so the audio would spike up. You don't even so have that to listen to it. You just go straight in and find it. When right? he was looking for his mistakes, he yeah. would just go back and look for those audio spikes. It's and nice. That's yeah. where they were. Um, I couldn't agree more with this next one is try not to exceed one minute per grade level. Mm -hmm. And maybe even that. Maybe even less than that. Like 30 yeah. seconds, you know. I Quick think in and out. Amber talks about this a lot for yeah. when she did her flipped Flip, classroom yeah. stuff. And I think that came from John Bergman okay. and people like that that yeah. did the flipped classroom stuff. Okay. Where, um, yeah, if your students are in fourth grade, try not to give them videos any longer than four minutes. Yeah. Because people's attention spans are, are not... Well, even say adults minutes. only have like a, what, a seven or eight minute attention span. Yeah, right? I know. So, and if you go I mean, look for a video on YouTube and you're searching for how to do something... Three minutes. If it's not three minutes, I'm not even looking at you. Exactly. <laughs> right? You see 17 minute you're ones like, no, and 10 out. minute ones. It's like, no, if I can get what I yeah. need in three minutes, yeah. I'm Make watching a playlist the instead if you need to, you know, do more than one video, but make a playlist, so... Yeah. can pick and choose which video they need to see and so otherwise i'm jumping through. and skipping around your yes. video to get to the part i need right. so right agreed sure and to the point yes um which i think kind of goes along with quality versus quantity so make it a good video doesn't need to be a long video right i agree okay um text images and video for variety so i i mean some of the video editing equipment that we have allow you to add text and different images and things like that but i don't know i guess youtube editor would eventually allow you to do some of that stuff you agree? yeah i just think you know mixing up some of that medium a little bit yeah. and giving people some variety i mean 
if you're using your webcam, don't have it just pointing at you the whole mm-hmm. time so that it's just you on the video the whole time. Maybe mm-hmm. you and maybe some sub- subtitles or maybe a mix of you and then what your screen looks like and then back to you. And there's different ways to do that depending right. on the tool you use. So right. just Did I see it- somewhere too that um, they say that although most people probably don't love to be on camera, um, that your students are more likely to watch your video if they can see you? Yes. Yeah. I've I've heard that too. I mean, I've heard stories from teachers where they've taken like Khan Academy videos or something instead of making one themselves. And then when they do the ones themselves, the kids have said that they much preferred watching the teacher. Yeah, teacher. Yeah, it's someone familiar. It's their voice. and. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my students would say that, but oh, yeah. Well, yeah. oh geez, everybody loves your voice. There, we'll, we'll see, Mr. Scottish man, <laughs> Mr. Scotland. Thank you, Mr. Scotland. <laughs> Mr. Scotland should have a calendar or something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, which takes me to the next point, which is I think just to be yourself and try and record with some kind of energy and humor Mm -hmm. i mean even if you've got that script to read try and make it sound conversational a little bit and add a few jokes or whatever you want but if you're not funny don't try to be funny well that could be funny too (laughs) that's true (laughs) so make your make your screencast personal like you right so yeah bring your personality to the screencast there it is there you go what do you think about recording with a partner, Mindy? I don't know. I've never done that before. I don't think. I think for people that are maybe nervous about screencasting, I think that's yeah. an interesting idea. Yeah. Like if there's two fourth grade teachers and you're both going to end up using the same video because you're teaching the same thing. Yeah. Why not have both people yeah. in on the video? Yeah. And you get different point of views, different voices. Mm-hmm. Give yourself a break when yeah. you listen to the other person. Yeah. Help each other out. I think... Um, my teaching partner and I did one or two a couple of times because we had um, so up on the wall for the writing process, writing process with first and second graders, if anyone's taught first and second grade knows how painful it is for editing and revising and getting feedback. And with first and second graders, it's it was hard. So um, I think her and I did our writing process together when we were talking about editing Um, with a friend so that the kids could actually see how you'd interact with someone else instead of me just quickly Mm -hmm. being like, this is what editing is. So we kind of went through a quick walkthrough of what that would look like. And then the QR codes were up on the um, writing process too so the kids could go and scan it, watch it, and then go and do it. So There you go. That was teamwork. So it worked, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Something different. Mm Mm-hmm. And the last one on there I put for... um, What's a Wacom tablet? What's that? Well, you know what? What, if, what is a Wacom tablet? I, tweet, it... I tweeted this out and I said, I don't know how you pronounce this. And I've seen this word lots of time. Is okay. It, is it Wacom? Is it... Wacom? 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 I don't know. I don't know either. It's one of these unusual words. And I got okay. a tweet back from that company yeah. that said, well, for your interest, it's pronounced... And they just wrote the word. And I'm like, well, that doesn't well, help. Yep. Nope. Sure doesn't. Yeah. That's, that was what I said. I said, <laughs> how do you pronounce Wacom? And they I wrote back that, and they said, it's out, Wacom. Right? And yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. Thank you. Yeah. Helpful. So, I mean, I think there's two types of um, screencasting that people do. Okay. One is when you record your screen and you run a website or something and you're showing people stuff. Yeah. And then there's like some of those Khan Academy type videos where you're inking yeah. and drawing out like mathematical equations yeah. or triangles and all that stuff they do in math and science. Right. And a Wacom tablet. <laughs> I'm just going to go with that. Yeah, just nail it. You yeah. Bet. Own it. Own it. Yeah. Is like a little pen okay. that goes on top of a, a square tablet you put on the side of your computer. Okay. And you use it instead of a mouse. Okay. So that when you write on the tablet, it writes on the screen. Oh, nice. Okay. And I know a lot of digital artists and things use that kind of thing for drawing mm-hmm. and for Photoshop and stuff like that. But sure. if you happen to have any of those, or you do a lot of that inking type of stuff, yeah, right. you know, it's terrible to do that with a mouse. I mean, if you have yes. a touchscreen device, mm-hmm. then 
okay, great, that will mm-hmm. help a lot. Right. Maybe a Surface with a pen or an iPad right. Pro with a pencil. Yeah. You can use that. But if you're using like a Chromebook or a PC and you want to experiment, mm-hmm. maybe a Wacom tablet is something <laughs> to look at. They're not as expensive as you might think. They're maybe 60 or $70 no, for an entry-level fair. one. Well, sure, if you're... And if you're going to get a lot of use out right. of it, maybe you can persuade somebody to invest in that. Right. All right, so after you've created this amazing screencast... Yeah. What should we do? What should you do? Definitely fix any mistakes that you want to. You know what? This is the other thing that I will say, and I've said this to you before, is that it's okay to make mistakes and let people see you make those mistakes. So unless, I mean, if it's a really big mistake, yes, edit it out. But if it's like you fumbling for, you know, a second, it's fine. It shows you're human. Yep, she's pointing at me again. Yes, um, oh, yes shaking my <laughs> finger at you. Yeah. You're right. I know. I think we had this conversation yeah. when we talked about podcasts. Yes. Because there was a time, and I don't know if I've said this on air or not, but there was a time where I used to go through and I used to edit out every time we said uh or um <laughs> or ah, uh, and it's like, and it just didn't end up sounding natural. Right. So um, I leave these in now. Yeah. Um, um, uh. <laughs> So, yeah, it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. But if you messed up and you're like, so if you click here and then you clicked in the wrong place. Yeah, right. That's a mistake. You want to take that out. Sure. Um, And we talked about that before. Just keep going if you make mistakes. And then I guess you can decide later if you want to take Mm -hmm. them out or not. Mm -hmm. So it's just very simple video editing type of deal where you would snip out the sections that you don't need. Right. And there are free video editors for basically every device. Mm Mm-hmm that you could take advantage of. Yeah, sure. Um, And also adding annotations to call it features or using some sort of screencasting tool that, like, follows your mouse. Like, Screencastify has this, you know, like, if you're using your mouse, it'll, um, when you go to click, like, it'll highlight yellow or something like that. So using something like that, I think it helps kids kind of track what you're doing, too. So... Yeah, and I forget to do this, but Patrick Donovan um, suggested we do this too, where you can like put little titles or call-ups on the screen sure. and things like that. I mean, I have done it in the past with the YouTube video editor because, yeah. you know, when I've done like a, a Google video and mm-hmm. then um, they change the name of a certain <laughs> button or something and you think, oh, that, this screencast is perfect <laughs> yeah. apart from that button, which yeah, is now right. called something else. Yeah. Sometimes you put like a little pop up on the screen that says this button is now called Oh, that's a good idea. New or something. Yeah. And you go back and you just put a little annotation over an existing video. Yeah. Just so people know that there's been a change. Yeah. So that that's on there too. Yeah. The other thing you can do in a video editor is um if you're somewhere where the internet is not cooperating and you're like click somewhere and then you're waiting for the page to load, mm-hmm. you either fill that time by talking mm-hmm. about something or anything yeah. or you just pause and you wait for the page to load and yeah. then later in the video editor you just trim out the bit where the page is loading and yeah. it looks like it loaded straight away yeah. but um but this is also why nobody you has your to wait for it up and going true when you start mm-hmm. that helps yeah right yeah i'm just thinking of times when you're like yeah. walking through something and yeah. you click here then you click yeah, here and you oh, do yeah, this yeah. And i see what you're saying you yep. have to wait for things to load and, and yeah. good stuff like that good point so video editors are fun. Yeah. Some some tools that we'll talk about in a minute here have all those editors built in. Yeah, right. So one thing um, I think, too, and something that our team does is whenever we create a screencast, we have what we call bumpers on those screencasts. Um, but we also add music and things like that. So um, making sure that if you're pulling in music, I use Ben Sound a lot. Um mm-hmm. So making sure that you cite, that you have to cite that stuff. You can't just use the um, audio that you're finding. And even though it might be free to use does not mean that it shouldn't be cited. So making sure, and I just usually put that stuff at the end um, to make sure that it's cited. So, and they'll give you a link even or whatever you're supposed to put on there. You just have to copy and put it on somewhere. So. And I think that's good modeling practice. So, you know, when you're showing that to students, that right. they see that, that you put that there. Mm-hmm. When they're doing their screencasts, yeah. they'll put that there too. Yeah. So then the next thing is how to share it, right, with your students. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube is an easy way to just put it out there and have links. Same thing with Drive, really. I mean, Drive's not necess- is works really well too. Drive works fine, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I don't use Vimeo. No, I don't either. But I know it exists. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> it's sometimes uh, I'll, I'll offer it up to teachers as an option because yep. sometimes they'll want to do something like password protect a video. Oh, yeah. And you can do that in Vimeo. You can choose a password and then if somebody finds the password out, you can change the password. So yeah. um, that's an option if yep. you're interested. Yep. That being said, you can also have YouTube videos that are unlisted. Not Correct. the same thing. I mean, it's not mm-hmm. the same as password protected because, yep. you know, once that link is shared, it's shared. But um, I guess we didn't really talk about that. But I think we have in the past. Yes, for sure. Oh, you put OneDrive on here. I put Let's OneDrive on there for the Microsoft people. <laughs> yes, yep. Which yep. is the same as Google Drive and, and works the same way. And works Dropbox that works that way too, that yeah. way too yep. if you're a Dropbox user. Yep. Or you can put it in places like Edpuzzle. Right. Yeah. You can upload videos directly to Edpuzzle. You, mm-hmm. a lot of people think you have to take that from, from YouTube, YouTube or somewhere else, but yeah, you can upload. Yeah. you mm-hmm. can upload your own video. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is one other thing that we think is important to mention is that if you're creating these videos, you might have students who um, need some sort of accessibility help if they can't hear the video, um, and so. We talked just briefly over email, I think even, about making sure that we share that YouTube has its a closed captioning feature in it um, and that it's important, I think, to make sure your students know how to turn that on and off if need be. And I didn't really know how this works, so this is where you have to pop in, but YouTube automatically generates those, that captioning, but you said it can be off sometimes, right? But you can go in as the owner of that video and edit then the closed captioning? Correct, yeah. yes. Okay. So they've got this auto-captioning thing where it will basically scan through and do this voice recognition mm-hmm. and do um, you know a speech-to-text type of deal. Right. And... Um, it does a pretty good job for the most part. I mean, certain things, certain words are going to be wrong sure. that it identifies. So you can just go back in there and click on an individual word and change it, mm-hmm. and you'll be good to go again. And right. it does that automatically for the chosen language that you upload right. it I'm in. Say that so, too. Right. Yeah. Which would be really actually, when you think about like Spanish teachers mm-hmm. who are doing screencasts in Spanish, would be awesome for those students to be able to see the actual Spanish. Like, because I could always yeah. read Spanish very well, but mm-hmm. I wasn't great at just like fluently speaking it. Um, so it would be nice to see. Yeah, you know. and, that, and that's an option you can select when you upload the video for mm-hmm. the first time. It will say language and it defaults to English if right. you're in the US. Right. But you could change that to Spanish and mm-hmm. maybe it will do Spanish subtitles too. Yeah. But the other option is I think you can just, if you. If you did create a script for mm-hmm. your screencast, right. you can upload the script to YouTube and then it will be perfect because yeah. you know as long as you read the script i mean those mm-hmm. are the words it's going to line it up with yeah. the talking that you did on the video mm-hmm. and you'll be good to go with closed captions and i would even suggest then if you're uploading the script too that you um i mean if you have a little bit extra time i always think it's nice when people do like um they put the time that they're talking about that specific topic in the screencast so if i can skip to it do you know yeah. what I mean? Like a little time bookmark yeah. in there. So in the notes, you're like, oh, at two minutes and 30 seconds, I'm talking about this. Mm-hmm. Or at three minutes, this is when I'm talking about this. But you're not going over three minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just click on that link and go straight to that part yeah, of the video. Right. I like that. It's nice. Too. Yeah. That's a nice, convenient option. Okay. What else you got here? You have a couple other ones I don't know. Um, or did I put these on here? You put those I on I did there. put these on here. I take mm-hmm. that back. Okay, so um, as we were kind of talking about this, I was looking then about, you know, other ways to add captions to videos. And I found um, this article or blog post that's about free online captioning tools, which I'm not real familiar with, but I thought I'd throw them out there to see if anybody um, was interested in taking a look. So one of them is amara.org. And dot sub dot com and subtitle horse. Have you heard of any of those? Subtitle before? horse. Subtitle horse. Wow. Giddy up. That's a great name. Yeah. So, um, and these are all just on the University of Washington's um, website. I think it's mostly for faculty and staff, um, so that if they're creating videos, then they can um, have some of those free tools and know what to do. Um, so I don't know, just something to kind of think about. There are outsourcing companies too. So if you have a long video, um, and I think Maggie just mentioned this the other day too, like anything over 10 minutes is going to be terrible to try and close caption yourself or even Mm. go back and fix on, fix on YouTube. So, 
Um, there are some companies that allow some outsourcing for that. So you send it out to them and then they do it for you and so send like it if, back. If you're doing a webinar or something like yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. So just to know that there are some of those tools and to be very conscious of, you know, making sure that those screencasts that you're creating are accessible to everyone. All right. Speaking All of right. tools. Yep. Let's talk tools for screencasting. Okay. And I can put these in the show notes for yep. you all. But we've got a little short list here for Mac, Windows, iPad, and for Chrome slash Chromebooks. Yeah, right. Now, when I threw these out here, I, I do often forget this is here, even though I do have a Mac. But Matt Townsley reminded me that QuickTime has built-in screen recording. Mm -hmm. So you have this tool already on a Mac if you use a Mac where you open QuickTime yep. and you go to File, New Screen Recording, and it will record your screen for you. Yeah. Save it straight to the desktop. You don't yep. need to have any browser plugins. You don't need internet connection unless mm -hmm. you are screencasting something from the web. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is a great and easy option on the Mac for yeah. sure. And you can even plug your iPad into your Mac and use QuickTime. You to can. record that too. Yes. Although iPad now has its own screen recording. Wow, yes. You're just jumping ahead all over the well, place. Well, I mean... What That's okay. I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Okay. You're right. Yeah. Screencast-O-Matic you Great have on options. here. Great options. I, I put Screencast-O-Matic for the Mac because yeah. um, you can download that from their website Yeah. and uh, and use that one. But that's a popular one. Mm -hmm. I know Mickey Mueller likes that one for yeah. sure. Um, Camtasia is the one that I probably use the most. And Snagit I use too. Snagit allows you to make GIFs, which is nice too. Yeah, and <laughs> sometimes I think about that when, like, a screenshot isn't enough. Yeah. A screencast is too much. Much, yeah. A GIF. Is, a GIF. A GIF is, is what you need. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just right. It's like Goldilocks, right? It's like a little short screencast yeah, but without the audio and stuff. Yep. So. Okay. ScreenFlow, I don't know that one. ScreenFlow is like Camtasia. Oh, okay. Um, just a competing product. Very high-end for people who need to make the best screencasts the best available. Screencast so if you're going to be a flip classroom professional or you want mm -hmm. to just geek out on all the latest things that you can do, like zooming in and out of screens and transitions and all that other good stuff. You know what Camtasia does? I was thinking about something you said earlier. What's that? You know when you have that notification that comes up on the top of the screen? Okay. You can mask that out so that it doesn't appear. Really? In a, in a screencast, yeah. Huh. You basically, you know, take a, a little copy, a little section of the video. Yeah. And then you tell it when to put that section on top of the notification that appears. So the notification appears behind that little copied. It layers nice. it out. So that's an option. Yeah, it is. In Camtasia. Probably in ScreenFlow as well. Yeah, I don't know. right. Well, in Camtasia, you can use on Windows too. It's just a software. Yeah. Same thing for Snagit. Yeah. And those two usually come together, right? If you buy Camtasia, don't you get Snagit? Mm -mm. You don't? It's no. an extra add-on? Same it's company, though, yeah? Same company, okay. TechSmith, that make them both. Okay. But, uh, yeah, Camtasia works on Windows. And yeah. It's called Camtasia... Well, it used to be called Camtasia Studio. I don't mm -hmm. know if it still is on Windows or not. Yeah. Screencast-O-Matic, we talked about, yeah. also works on Windows. Mm -hmm. PowerPoint lets you do screencast. Did you know yes. that? No, I didn't know that. So inside of PowerPoint, if you've got a, a recent version of PowerPoint, yeah. you can do a screencast in with PowerPoint and it will drop it straight back into your PowerPoint. Okay. Or you can download it from PowerPoint and just have it as a separate file if you oh, want to. Interesting. So just an extra little option for Windows users. Yep. iPad. So like I mentioned, iOS 11. Now, I used a screen recording on... Um, the iPad recording, but it did not record my voice. I does it record voice? It does and record I was just, voice. So I so thought it was two, just something with my phone. There's two know. possible things that okay. could be going on there. Yeah. One, um, it doesn't turn on the microphone by default. Oh. So when you go in to do that, you press that button in the control center yeah. to start recording. Yeah. If you press and hold that button, are you kidding me? It shows you whether you can turn the microphone on or off. Interesting. So. Yeah, and by I, some yeah. reason, I don't know why it's off by default, but yeah. it is off by default. So I've been having problems with my phone, So I and I was doing it on my phone because there was something for um, it's probably the that. Seesaw Family app. And I'm like, what is going on? I thought it must just be my phone. So, huh, I didn't know that. Okay. Good to know. Thank you for sharing. Built-in screen recording on iPads um, mm -hmm. if you're running iOS 11 or later. Mm -hmm. If Otherwise, if you want that kind of inking solution, we talked about those mm -hmm. whack little those, those tab, those wig, whack them, wake them, yeah, wake them, we're saying wake them. Those tablets, okay. 
Um, and then you you should use an app called IPvo Whiteboard. Oh yeah, people that make the IPvo uh, cameras that is a great app for screencasting. It really is a good app. You don't need an Apple Pencil. Uh, mm-hmm. You can just any stylus will work with that, and you mm-hmm. can do those you know type of equation type yep. things, multiple pages. Yep. Keep recording. It saves all to your camera roll. Right, it's good stuff on there. Mm-hmm. Um, educations. And you know what? I was, it's funny because I was just thinking about educations because I used educations a ton when I was in the classroom. Mm-hmm. I feel like they went to like some sort of paid model mm-hmm. though, did they? So something's going on there now. And I remember kind of going back in and I felt like I had lost some videos and stuff. So yeah. I don't That was always my go-to thing as well when yeah. I first started using the iPads. Yeah. But then they did start charging and yeah. you can have a class and all this kind yeah. of stuff. But I don't know. It's it's hard. They got to keep the lights on. Yeah, I know. I know. Yep, so, absolutely. Same with um, Show Me, which yes. used to be another popular one. Mm-hmm. And Doseri. For iPads. And Doseri. Yep. Yeah. I think right. Doseri, you can still do some stuff for free. Yeah. For sure. But uh, another one that did go paid or subscription based was yeah. Explain Everything. And that's subscription based, huh? I uh-huh. thought it was just paid. I didn't remember that. They used to have one called Explain Everything Classic, which was like. I don't know, five dollars or seven dollars up front or something. Right. But I think their new one is subscription based now. So the thing about Explain Everything though is that you get like an app for your iPad, and then you can also use it online. Is that right? You can use it in your browser too. They have a, a software, Chrome what version. Is it? Yeah. But yeah, they have a Chrome something version like that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's an online version, but a Chrome app for sure. Okay. So speaking of Chrome, yeah, what do you use for Chrome? I use Screencastify. Yeah, yeah, that's just a a go to. Yeah, it's easy. It's just my Chrome extension. I just click on it and I start recording, and then it saves directly into my drive. And I always used to use Screencastify too. Yeah, whenever I was screencasting in, in Chrome, which yeah. wasn't all that often, but you learned some something people new, right? Taught me yeah. something new. Thank which you, Twitter was thank you to Twitter. That mm-hmm. was uh, Devin Schoening, yeah. Josh Allen, and Stephen Sauter. Yeah, all like one called Loom. I know. I saw which that I'd never too, heard and of so before. I hadn't looked at it. So I'm hoping that you you went in and played with it then. I have played with it a bit. Okay. Yep, yeah, it is and it's really nice and clean and well yeah. designed. It puts like a little circle of your head down in the corner. And a circle of your head. Yeah. As so not a square, to like a square of your head? Not a square, like a nice circle. Really? Yeah, like avatar-y type okay. thing down in the bottom there. Um, it's got um, some basic uh, video editor functions built in. And you can also comment on somebody's video at a specific time. So you could put this out. To like the, on your own video or someone else's? Other people can comment on your video. So you could have the students leave comments at Mm -hmm. certain points, like, you know, 1 minute 30. Yeah, this is the part I always struggle with, or I don't really understand this part, or things like that. So you could have some conversations back and forward on your video, which I think is a very interesting idea, too. Okay, so is it a... It looks like something I install for Chrome. Correct. So is it a Chrome extension, or it can't be an app, because those don't really exist anymore, right? It is a Chrome extension. I see that, okay. They record and save all your videos to the the Loom website, mm-hmm. where you can actually use folders to organize and and do all your videos that so way too. So it won't go directly into my drive. So it doesn't go okay. directly into your drive. No, because I do like that. Yes, because I can share straight from there. Even so, okay, I'm gonna play with this and see what I think. Thanks. I know because Thanks, guys. I was talking to those guys a little bit on Twitter, and they said yeah. you used to use Screencastify yeah. because you know it's so handy. And um, you know Mike Marotta and Kelly Self both said they use Screencastify, and they mm-hmm. like that it goes straight to Drive. But you know those guys are like, well, we used to use Screencastify, yeah. and now we use Loom. And I'm like, huh? Well, it must be worth a look. Yeah, for sure. So All it's right. use it. Loom. Dot, use Loom. dot com. I've added it. Check we'll it see. out. It I could will. be a future tank nugget that you could come back and give us more information on, Mindy. Okay. Done. Next up, what else do we got? Uh, well, Explain Everything works on Chrome. We yes, said that right? Screencast-O-Matic now works on Chromebooks. Oh, yeah? They have a Chrome as extension. An app? Oh, it's yeah. an extension? Yeah, which is kind of interesting. And one of the things I like about that is, give, I mean, I think Screencastify has these too, but some annotation type tools mm-hmm. where you can draw on your screencast yeah. and, and annotate and highlight some stuff. Nice. So, yeah. Interesting. All right. So lots of different tools to check out. 
and we'll put links to all those in the the show notes. Yeah, and you right. Can go and take a go look and browse, and, and if mm-hmm. you find an awesome one that isn't on our list or right. there's something that you especially like about these, then let us know. Yeah, we'd love to hear feedback. All right, on to our favorite part of the show, Tech Nuggets. Our favorite part of the show. I know. I said that different this time, didn't I? Yeah. Waiting for you to say something. Okay. And you did. There we go. So, right on cue. Continue. You going first here? I can go first. Okay. Um, this is one that didn't make the cut last episode right. when we were doing our nuggets, and you oh. said, we're going to have to stop. Yes. We're going to have to stop here soon, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, PDF Candy from Leslie Fisher. Right. So I used to use this um, other app, sometimes called 123, 123apps.com. Okay. But PDF Candy is a very interesting website that mm-hmm. lets you do all kinds of interesting things with PDFs. Yeah. So PDFs are that great universal format that everybody loves. It works on all devices. I know. Not everybody loves PDF. I don't love PDF. You don't love PDF. No, I get a PDF and then I go into Google Docs and I convert it into a Google Doc. Okay. Okay. Because? I don't know. I just don't like PDFs. Okay. Well, this may be a tool for you because okay. you can do all of those conversion type things with PDF Candy. You can do PDF to Word. You can do PDF to JPEGs. You can edit PDFs. You mm-hmm. can merge PDFs. Mm. You can split PDFs into separate PDFs. You can, wait, you can merge PDFs. Take two PDFs and make it into one PDF. Okay. I'm with you. You can split a PDF up and take pages out that you don't need. So if it's oh, a 50-page like PDF and you only need like six of the pages, Good one. you can split okay. PDFs up. Um, you can extract text. You can extract images. Mm-hmm. You can do rotation. You can crop parts out. So PDF Candy is kind of your one-stop shop mm-hmm. for working with PDFs. Interesting. And I did a short blog post about it for yeah, our website. That. Yeah, and I will link to that in the show notes if you want to go check it out. But I know Beth said, I just used PDF Candy and it was amazing. Yeah. And it worked. So check it out if you work with PDFs, like a lot of teachers do, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, and, right. And uh, you want to do stuff that is normally a little more restricting. Mm-hmm. All right. So my tech nugget is, comes from, you're going to help me with her last name, Trisha Foglestad. Is that right? Could be. Okay. Wacom. Um, what's yeah? Wacom. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, Trisha, if I've not said your name correctly. So um, I found this on Twitter. It was a s'more that she had put out that was a green screen workshop ideas. And um, I know I've heard you say this too is about trying to find ways to move beyond the weather forecast and green screen. And I thought some of these were um, very interesting. So one of them was. Did you ever watch Electric Company? I don't know what that is. I'm not surprised. Okay. So Electric Company, they used to use like these profiles of um, characters, right, on the show. And one of them would say like the beginning sound of a word and then this other one would say the ending sound of the word. And the profiles, like it would be like shh and the, the shh would come out into the middle. And then the other two, the other person would say op. Right? So together it'd make the word shop. And so it was very iconic. So um, she shows a way of how students could do that with green screen with their silhouettes. Hmm. Interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, how I many of these ideas are on here? There's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Lots, okay? It's like Sesame Street. It is, yes. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Um, there was one where it showed a snow globe and how to create a snow globe using um, inside the doing the mask feature. Oh, yeah. Um, and then talking about transparency with kids. I thought that was an interesting way to kind of talk about transparency. And so there's this really cute, like, kind of cartoonish snow globe with kids dancing around in the snow globe. Mm. Um, moving postcards, which was also using the mask feature. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Just some different things on here that I hadn't thought of before that I thought, you know, maybe th- I, it's definitely leveling up your green screen. Okay. Okay. 
So take um, a look at that, and um, we'll add a link to her s'more for those ideas. And she does tutorials then for each one of those. She has like a blog post for each single one. Awesome. Okay. I like that. All I right. have a presentation at iTech coming up in October. I might borrow some borrow of her some ideas. Borrow some ideas, and yeah. give her credit, credit for Credit, of course. Of course. Okay. Uh, second one I'll do is just a quick one then. This is also from Isti in the summer. I ran across... Um, I didn't run across her, but I I met a teacher who um, was using Switcher Studio Mm -hmm. with her journalism class. Okay. And Switcher Studio is kind of like a... It's it's an app for the iPad, and it lets you connect several iOS devices together. I believe up to nine Mm -hmm. iOS devices. And you have this app called Switcher Studio... And it lets you pick and choose the camera angle that you want to appear on a live broadcast. Oh. So if you think about a live broadcast, you know, they'll start with both the news anchors side by side. Mm -hmm. And then it will zoom in and it will just give you one news anchor. And then it will just cut to the other news anchor. Then Mm -hmm. it cuts to the weather person. It lets you do all that from this iPad. You just tap on the device that you want to show that camera from, that iPad or that iPhone that you've got set up. And you can have a professional multicam video set up. What other app used to do that? We talked about it forever ago. Well, What's we have other? another camera that does something similar called the, is, the Mevo yes, camera. Yes, that's right. Yes. And that's that's just a one camera solution. Yeah, right. And it takes like a 4K video, but then it condenses it down I to feel like different angles. I there's an app we've talked things. about, though, that did that. Maybe there is. I think there is. You were like really excited about it for a while. It was a while ago. I'm going to look it up. I'm thinking it's the Mevo because it has an app that lets you do that. Okay. Okay. So sure. there you go. Switch the studio. It's not free, but if you have a journalism class and mm-hmm. some iPads kicking around, it yep. could be a fun way to up your game. Okay. So um, my next one, my last one, mm-hmm. is actually from Tony Vincent, and it's called Yelkey. So um, it is a URL shortener. And the when you create your URL, so like if you ever go into Tiny URL or Bitly or something like that, you can customize your URL and put like a word in, or it will just generate like this hodgepodge of letters and numbers, which Correct. is really hard for people, I think, to put that in correctly. And we use this a lot because, um, you know, we share our slides or docs or whatever with people. So this one I think is interesting because it shortens a URL, but it puts like words, like it'll choose just like a word instead of numbers and crazy letters or whatever. The interesting thing about it, I think, is that it's, you can choose how long that URL is good for. Okay. The longest it will be open is 24 hours and then that URL disappears. Nice. Okay. So that's how they can use words because... They're constantly being reused. So, and this works well for me, I think, because a lot of times um, I share all of my stuff in Google. And so when I share it, then I remind people to use that little add to your Google Drive button. Mm-hmm. So when they go mm-hmm. to my slides, I'm like, so, so they, would, they wouldn't need that URL Anymore. longer than 24 hours anyway. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And I, like I said, that came from Tony Vincent. So. I it wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't mention mention Tony at least once. We got him in just before the end. <laughs> just slid him right in there. I also saw that at ISTE. It was uh, Leslie Fisher that showed oh, that. Okay. And so, yeah, it just gives you a URL with a random word like right. yellkey.com forward slash banana. Yeah. And so you just have that as your, your go-to for the year for your class. And, mm-hmm. you know, the kids are want to know what the yellkey word is. The right. yellkey word today is flower. <laughs> <laughs> and they go to yellkey.com forward slash flower. Yeah. And right. you're getting a routine for that. So. That's good. I like it. I do, too. All right. So we probably have things to do with the Mm -hmm. rest of our day. We should finish this up. (laughs) It's been a long podcast. It's been a long podcast. (laughs) Happy editing to you. Happy editing to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's it. We're going to call it a day, yes? Yes. Okay. All right. So I am at Team Kearney on Twitter, and Jonathan is at Jonathan Wiley. Our team account is at DL. G-W-A-E-A, and you can use our hashtag EdTechTakeout to take the show. If you prefer, you can send us an email to podcast at gwaea.org. So until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast. podcast.